All right. How's everybody doing today? Hotep. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Thursday, June 30th, 2022, and we are live. How's everybody doing today? I, I got my laptop back from the repair shop. It's as good as new. So uh, I'm broadcasting live from the laptop again, and I'm, I can teach my online classes again as well. So um, we're going. I'm going to give you a preview of the 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays: Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So this 10 week online class, we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place, all right? And the class is on sale right now, $60, regularly $130. And we have the link for it in the thread of the broadcast here. And it's also on our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, all right? So how's everybody doing? And uh, uh, in this class, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, uh, everything. So, uh, you're going to learn a lot in it. All right. So I want to check and see, uh, how I'm coming through as well. Hopefully everybody can hear me. All right. Uh, I want to test the, uh, audio right quick here. Uh, just give me a second here. So I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint presentation and I want to go over some of the topics that we deal with, uh, in our class. Okay. And you can also use this information with your children as well. I would say the uh, information is uh, PG-13. The content is PG-13. So, uh, and it's very visual. The class is very visual also. So I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, uh, video clips. And we take you through history to uh, understand uh, who we are and understand uh, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay, so let me bring up the PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, here we go. All right, so in this class, uh, we can't start studying our history in slavery, uh, even when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to understand. We can't start studying in 1619, we can't start in the 1440s with the Portuguese going into what's known what's known as present-day Mauritania in 1441 on, on Tom Gonzalez and picking up Africans, taking them back to Portugal. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who enter into the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD and understand the uh, connection to all of this, understand how all of this history and these different bits of, and pieces of history that we may hear here and there, understand how all of this is connected, okay? And this African history and culture that gives us our foundation, it gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. And this gives us a uh, cultural paradigm that we see reality through and this also influences our economic empowerment and our political empowerment. It's our history and culture that gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. Um, so this is extremely important, okay? And if you listen to the African History Network show, and we'll be on live this Sunday as well, uh, we know we're um, dealing with 4th of July uh, time of the year as well, or 4th of July, as Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango called it. But uh, we'll be on live this Sunday, uh, also 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on our social media platforms and uh, the African History Network uh, right here on Facebook. OK. All right. Now, some of the things that we deal with in this class, this class, uh, this 10 week online course now only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but we deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We take you through the history chronologically. Um, 
and the history that leads up to the slave trade and African people taking place. Okay. August 20th, 2019 marked the 400th year anniversary of the 20 and odd Africans on that white lion pirate ship. Cause it was a, it was a, it was a pirate ship. And we break all this history down in the course, the white lion pirate ship that comes into point comfort in uh, Virginia uh in there uh, in august 20th 1619 they traded for food and water and supplies things like this at this point in time codified slave laws don't exist in any of the 13 colonies okay it's really important to understand how all this evolves this is why we take you through this history chronologically okay i know you you have a 1619 project i know people think that unfortunately many of our people think that african people first came to this land that we call the united states of america um 400 years ago or 403 years ago or something like that in 1619. 1619 did happen but we've been in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago this was our land stolen from us and one of the books that I reference in the class is from one of my friends, Dr. David M. Hotel. The first Americans were Africans documented evidence. So yes, the transatlantic slave trade did happen. It did happen, but we have to understand a chronology of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. This at one point, this, this land was called Turtle Island. Okay. And, and some native Americans referred to it as Turtle Island. African people were here in this land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago before Native Americans came into existence. And in my um, presentations that I did for Juneteenth uh, this year, and uh, there's one that we're broadcasting uh, that I did on June 19th, 2022 on in Inkster, Michigan. Uh, in the presentations that I that I did and the media interviews and things like this this is one of the things that i talked about okay this is why we have to understand this chronology of history this is why this is so important we did not come to this land uh when we first came to this land it wasn't conquered by europeans and shackled in chains and enslaved no that that history did happen but you got to study the history uh tens of thousands of years of history before that okay so um and this is one of the problems with the 1619 project. It doesn't deal with that history prior to largely 1619. It talks a little bit about 1526 when the Spanish are taking Africans into the territory we call uh, South Carolina and Georgia in 1526, 93 years before 1619. Okay, but it doesn't deal with the African presence thousands of years before that. Now, uh, 2019 was known as the year of return and many African Americans were reconnecting and, and still are reconnecting to Africa and traveling to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central and South America and have been in the land we call the United States. Today we call the United States of America or Turtle Island or whatever you want to call it we've been here at least 51,700 years. Okay. And these were the Khoisan who come from Southern Africa. So some of the things that we deal with in the class, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archeological discoveries that are causing experts uh, to rethink everything. And when we deal with, we deal with numerous archeological discoveries in the class. Okay. You have to, you can't start in 1619. You can't start with roots. You can't start, in 1441 okay you can't start in 1562 with sir john hawkins and the good ship jesus and the, the english getting involved in the transatlantic slave trade you got to go back thousands of years and deal with ancient africa and how we get to the transatlantic slave trade okay but uh when we look at these archaeological discoveries and there was one that just came out of uh there was one that just came out of egypt um that dealt with uh 250 mummies that were uh that were being displayed and, and that were unearthed um 
May 31st, 2022, Associated Press and Washington Post and others reported Egypt unearths trove of artifacts, 250 mummies in ancient necropolis. Okay. And these are the sarcophagi, the painted coffins. The, there's archaeological discoveries that are taking place every uh every other week. And the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So when these archaeological discoveries come out, they uh oftentimes keep having to push back the timelines and they keep talking about how uh everything these things are much older than we originally thought or we were originally told okay so we deal with shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved africans on the plantations as well um freemasonry america and the founding fathers uh we look at origins of the word uh, of the terms America, etc. Because you have to look at language as well. We break down why Africa is not named after a Roman general Publius Cornelius Scipio, who takes the surname Africanus after the Battle of Zama in uh, 202 BC, where he defeats Hannibal Barca. No, Africa is not named after him. He took his surname after the territory that he was conquering. This is why you have to understand history and language. What uh, we do with what is the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to it starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play in uh, the spread of the transatlantic slave trade? He is he's crucial to the, the spread early on of the transatlantic slave trade. He helps to lay the foundation for slavery, racism, racism, capitalism and exploitation of indigenous people. When did African people first come to the land that we call the United States of America? Uh, uh, as enslaved Africans, and uh, we deal with did Africans sell themselves into slavery? That complicated history, also, because we had a cultural servitude history. We didn't have we did, African people traditionally did not have slavery. We had a cultural servitude system. Um, we deal with Freemasonry, the fake Woody Lynch letter, 1712, links to ancient Kemet, Egypt, and early Christianity, uh, the first Holy Trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story and a lot more. This is, I mean, this, this is a ton of information you're going to get in this class. It's over 50 articles that we reference. We have uh, uh, slides, video clips, everything. OK. And when we look at the uh, Washington Monument, OK, we're looking at African history, African culture. This is a ancient African symbol. OK, the Washington Monument. Uh, called a Tekken, all right? And you've heard me talk about this before. Um, there were about 1,200 Tekken new, Tekken new for plural, all throughout ancient Kemet. Today, they're less than 12. But this is a symbol from Freemasonry also, because the foundation of Freemasonry comes from uh, the teachings in the Nile Valley region of Africa and the teaching in the lodges in ancient Kemet and coming from the mystery, what, what are, are called the mystery systems, okay? All right, so we see we see the Washington Monument here, and we see uh, the Tekken here in uh, in Egypt as well. Now, there was a good article from FaceToFaceAfrica.com called um, "Cometic." It, uh, it's called Cleopatra's Needle. Cleopatra's Needle: How Three Ancient Egyptian Obelisks Ended Up in New York City, London, and Paris. How three ancient egyptian obelisks ended up in north in new york city london and paris so a lot of times when we see architecture we see statues and things like this we don't know that it is related to africa okay and in meridian hill park in uh washington dc they have a waterfall in the shape of an ankh which is the african symbol of eternal life okay the african key of life because the layout of washington dc is a copy of the layout of ancient kemet the layout of ancient egypt and this is something that tony browder deals with in his book uh, egypt on the potomac and this is one of the books that we use in the class now you don't have to purchase any of these books in the class if you want to get them for your library you can but we reference them in in class so, you, so it's easy for you to follow along this book here deals with how the layout of Washington, is, Washington D.C. is based upon ancient African principles. Okay, um, 
So we see the uh, the Tekken on the left is from uh, London, okay? We see the one in the middle, New York City, and the one on the right, Paris, France, okay? Um, and this is a symbol of resurrection coming from the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru. Now, ancient Egyptians or the ancient Kemetic people called obelisks Tekkenu. You'll see different spellings for the word Tekkenu also, Tekkenu for plural. And they were also used to tell the time in the past. Their pinnacles were basically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say that obelisks represented immortality and eternity and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Their long structure helped to connect the heavens and the earth. Okay, now I'm gonna post the information here uh, once again so you can register for this 10 week online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade where they didn't teach you in school. And it's on sale $60, regularly $130. We do the sessions live, all the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. So a year from now, two years from now, you can watch the entire class. We also have this information at our new, very easy to use website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Our new website, it shows up uh, very well on your smartphone. It's very easy to uh, navigate and order right from your smartphone and register for the classes and order the DVD lectures, okay? So our next class is uh, coming up uh, Saturday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we have the information right here. Just click on register here and uh, takes you to the next page. And you can register. Just click right here on enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching content, okay? And let me bring this up here. Let's show you. It takes you to the next page here where the classes are housed. And just click on enroll and you can start watching the content and you can join us in class live also. All right, now let's continue here. Okay, so currently Cleopatra's Needle is the name given to three ancient Egyptian obelisks or Tekkenu, in, uh, one in New York City, one in London, and one in Paris, France, okay? However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. The obelisks um, in New York and London are carved out of red granite from the quarries of Aswan, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The uh, two uh, Tekkenu or obelisks were commissioned by Nesubiti or Pharaoh Thutmose III for the temple uh, for the Temple of the Sun of Heliopolis near modern day Cairo, with each weighing about 224 tons and 68 feet tall. 224 tons, which keep in mind a ton is 2,000 pounds. Uh, read this article here Cleopatra's Needle How Three Ancient Egyptian Obelisks Ended Up in New York City, London, and Paris. Also, when you go to cemeteries, you'll see smaller tech and new there as well. That's Africa. The, the, these are taken straight out of ancient chemists, straight from the Nile Valley region of Africa. We see these various symbols that connect us to Africa. And Europeans take these symbols and represent them as their own, okay? And then we are taught to run away from Africa. We're taught to run away from what our ancestors created when everybody is running to it uh, one way or another, all right? Uh, it's been, and, 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 and also running to it physically and extracting the mineral wealth out of Africa as well. Okay, now, uh, let's continue here. All right, so how's everybody doing? How you all like this type of information? This is just a brief overview of the 10-week online class that I teach on Saturdays. 
ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And we also have this um, uh, in a bundle pack. So you can uh, the, register for this class as well as the class I teach on Sundays. Uh, you get right for a limited time only, you get both classes for $100. The class I teach on Sundays is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay. And that's a fantastic class as well. That's a 10 week online course also. Uh, and you're going to learn a lot in that one. That second class we start, uh, we teach this one on Sundays. Uh, so the second class, we start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution. And we go through our history chronologic, chronologically uh, to see what leads up to uh, the transatlantic, see what leads up to the Civil War taking place. And we do a reconstruction, Jim Crow era, World War II, uh, Great Migration, uh, World War I, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, okay? So that's the uh, second class that I teach on Sundays uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And we have a bundle pack here as well. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me at um, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, and uh, you'll get a 50% uh, discount on the bundle pack if you've taken any of my online classes in the past all right so uh let's continue here so here is a famous uh statue of a star set in heru who the greeks called osiris isis and horus they're known as the first holy trinity and when we look at uh some information dealing with the Tekken Nu, because this is where the Tekken comes from, from this story. There were approximately 1,200 Tekken Nu built in ancient Kemet, uh, but only about a dozen or less than a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekken Nu removed from Egypt uh, are now in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, London, uh, London, uh, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere uh, throughout the world. The Tekken Nu are now called obelisks by their new uh, by their new owners, and few people know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar. All right. Uh, this is from page 17 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. And we know that Asar is cut up by his brother Set into uh 14 pieces and 13 of those pieces are recovered by uh his wife all set and the uh 14th piece that was not recovered was the phallus okay so the tekken was uh erected to represent the missing piece of a star's body and the Tekken is a symbol of resurrection and transformation. Okay, this is what the Tekken uh, represents. Okay, and it's a spirit is a spiritual symbol. Um, when we look at the movie Star Wars, created by George Lucas. Okay, George Lucas, uh, his mentor is uh, Bill Campbell, who wrote The Power of Myth, and uh, an inspiration for the movie Star Wars is the Asar, what's known as the Asarian drama, the Asarian drama, and the 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 story of Asar Aset and Heru and uh, Asar being killed and being resurrected, and uh, his death being avenged by his son Heru, uh, who uh, kills his uncle Set. Set uh, kills Asar and Asar's death is avenged by his son heru now we know that uh freemasonry the foundation of freemasonry are the teachings coming from uh the ancient egyptian mystery system the teachings coming from the nile valley region of africa uh, masonic temples are considered houses of light and the term uh consider houses of light or temples of learning masonic temples the term Mason 
that we see in Freemason, the term Mason means child of light and is a direct reference to the highest degree of the Kemetic Egyptian, uh, of the Kemetic education system. Kemet's one of the original names for Egypt, referring to land of the blacks. The 33 degrees of instruction or teaching within uh, Freemasonry represent a fraction of the 360 uh, of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprise the ancient Kemetic system of education, yet with less than 10% of wisdom of ancient Kemet, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years, okay? And if you read page 33 of Egypt on the Potomac, uh, Tony Brada breaks this down here as well. So we have to understand where these teachings come from and we have to reclaim what our ancestors created okay um so and as you go through another another book that we use in the class a fantastic book and once again you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class the excerpts that i'll share with you this book here i just got a new copy because my original copy of now valley contributions to civilization i got in 1994 and it's beat up and the pages are falling out so i just got a new copy of now valley contributions to civilization by tony browder so this is another book that we use in the class a fantastic fantastic book this information is great to use once again with your children because it's a very visual class and there's video clips and things like this so it really helps to keep them engaged and they may not watch an entire one and a half hour two hour class at one time but they can watch in the segments and you can share this information with them in segments also okay now let's continue here how do you all like this type of information give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like on this broadcast uh 50 of the 56 signers of the declaration of independence were freemasons and 13 of the 39 signers of the u.s constitution were freemasons also for the four of the first five presidents were freemasons as well okay so uh and then we you know we deal with uh some of the netaru uh D -d different forces of nature nature the different deities and ancient Kemet. there's so much that we do within this course um i've been teaching i've been studying history for 30 years i've been teaching for um uh going back to 2010 and this class here uh evolved out of a four and a half hour lecture that i did on this subject matter and that four and a half hour lecture was an accumulation of about seven years of research uh in this class i've been teaching on and off since 2017 so it's evolved immensely since 2017 okay so um i'll set the first queen of, of kemet in the mythology wife of asar mother of heru heru is the first ka rest or what we call christ because christ is a title not a name christ meaning anointed or anointed one coming from the word ka rest the Kemetic word ka rest, ka meaning spirit, rest meaning to rise. Ka rest means the rising of the spirit. This, this is a very ancient concept, okay? Um, and he resurrects Asar after uh, Asar is killed by his brother Set. Here's another depiction of all Set. You'll see her depicted oftentimes with a throne on her head. Her name all Set mean, means she of throne because who sits on the throne in Kemet is determined by is matrilineal is determined by the bloodline on the woman's side of the family coming through the womb of a woman it comes from the woman's side of the family is matrilineal as opposed to coming from the the male side of the family being patrilineal um all said is associated with love and fertility so we go with uh uh, uh heru being born on december 25th of a virgin birth to the virgin all set and we go with we deal with this story being told over and over again throughout various cultures okay with different people's names put on it and then it gets represented to the world by europeans as if they created this story themselves and then it gets told to african people 
and we deal with the we deal with the copy of the copy of the copy of the story as opposed to going to the original story which comes from our ancestors and many of us have been taught that hate ancient egypt hate egyptians you look at the mythological story of the exodus now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true just means you have to do some research to understand what i'm talking about okay um and i dealt with this during when i did my presentation dealing with the origins of easter but we go from our set in in heru uh born of a virgin birth december 25th to the black madonna and child which is which was worshipped all throughout europe the black madonna and child okay which comes from that story and the black madonna and child was worshipped throughout europe even before the uh the moors went in the 711 a.d which is a crucial period of history the the moors conquest of the iberian peninsula and they settled settled in uh, southern uh, uh spain uh what they called al andalus all right but then you get the european version the de the the decolorized version of this story with the white mary and jesus okay now the letter j did not exist until 1630 a.d the letter J comes from uh, the letter I, all right? The letter J didn't exist until 1630 AD, number one. Number two, what happens is, and why it's so crucial to understand this period of history, is that as Europeans come out of the Dark Ages uh, in the 1400s, and we deal with that period of history as well, and we deal with the Crusades in 1096 AD, um, and, and uh, we deal with... Uh, the teachings that the Moors take into Europe that bring Europe out of the Dark Ages, as uh, Europeans are, are starting to circumnavigate the globe and you have conquests by Christopher Columbus and others, as they start extracting uh, the wealth and enslaving people in um, these various areas that they're conquering, like uh, Panama and Honduras and Hispaniola, uh, et cetera, okay? As they go in and start conquering other people's lands, they start to rebuild Europe. And as Europe becomes dominant, as you have a rise in uh, European nations and European dominance, starting based, uh, largely with Portugal and Spain, as you have a rise in that, you start having a rise in the European phenotype, okay? So the European phenotype starts becoming dominant and historical figures that were African get reinterpreted as European. OK, so Michelangelo paints the Sistine Chapel and he uses his aunt and uncle as the image of Adam and Eve or and he uses um, he has uh, he depicts God as being white. He depicts the angels as being white. You look at Greek mythology. Hercules gets de gets depicted as white. Hercules was originally African. You look at uh, Zeus. Zeus gets depicted. Zeus gets depicted as white. Zeus was Zeus was originally African. Zeus was originally African, and actually, when you study the mythology, um, and when you study Greek when you study Greek mythology, um, Zeus comes from Ethiopia. In the Greek mythology, Zeus comes from Ethiopia. Okay, there was when I was researching uh, the story of Andromeda and Cassiopeia, and these uh, this is in Greek mythology, and this deals with two um, African women who uh, uh, you have astro um, astronomical constellations uh, named after them. Okay, Andromeda and Cassiopeia. Um, I was researching them and uh, there was a uh, painting that I came across. There was a painting that I came across that dealt with uh, depicting Andromeda and Cassiopeia as Europeans and depicting the king of Ethiopia as a European. OK, uh, well. Uh, and they depicted them as Greeks, okay? Well, the Greeks did not conquer Ethiopia, all right? But if you 
didn't know if you didn't know that and you just saw the painting then you know you would just think that you think oh the greeks conquered ethiopia uh no okay this is why it's it's important to understand this history and understand these lies that have been told about this history as well okay and you know your thoughts create feelings your feelings create actions and behaviors your actions and behaviors create results uh what you do for yourself what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself what you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself what you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read heard and seen about yourself okay so this is why this information is so important so the, 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 this critical period of history 8th century AD the Moors go into the Iberian Peninsula uh you have uh, Tariq Ibn Ziyad uh he crosses the straits they go in from Morocco into uh, the southern portion of the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal where he where they land uh it, it was called Jebel Tariq which means Tariq's mountain in Arabic okay it, but it gets translated as Gibraltar or called the rock of Gibraltar this was named after an African man named Moor uh Tariq Ibn Ziyad okay so this is just a sample of the type of information that we deal with in the class uh we look at different uh we go through and briefly look at different african civilizations and you know we take you throughout history and, and once again when we deal with the uh first holy trinity of asar aset and heru if we look here at egypt on the potomac this is uh, a critical uh piece of the class and a critical it's really critical to understanding this history um the story of Asar. this is page 95 of egypt on the potomac um, of non valley contributions to civilization the story of Asar, Oset, and heru is the first story in the recorded history of a man of a holy royal family the trinity immaculate conception virgin birth and resurrection okay evidence of this trinity is known to have existed in ancient nubia or tana hesi and tana hesi is the mother of ancient kemet is known to have exist in ancient nubia as late as 3300 bce it's important for people to understand this because we've we've been taught especially in organized religion and, and i'm not attacking anybody's religion but you have to understand the origins of that religion we've been taught in organized religion especially christianity oftentimes to hate africa and hate egypt and not understand where these stories come from that are in the bible you're dealing with a you, you you're dealing with a reinterpretation of very ancient african stories coming from the now valley region of africa especially ancient kemet coming from mesopotamia coming from sumer things like this okay you're dealing with a reinterpretation of these stories largely depicted as europeans oftentimes okay but but the story of this first holy trinity goes back to ta as late as 3300 bce before the christian era before christ this is an ancient african story uh so evidence of the trinity is known to have existed in ancient nubia or time as late as 3300 bce carved on the walls of the temple of luxor around uh, circa 1380 bce okay are scenes which depict the following okay so you have the annunciation the immaculate conception the virgin birth and the adoration this is african this comes from my ancestors in the uh, the lower panel you see the, the the first depiction is the annunciation the netter dehuti is shown announcing to the virgin offset the coming birth of their son heru this is the annunciation the second depiction you see the immaculate conception the netter nef k-e-n-p-h the netter nef who represents the holy ghost and the Netahet Heru, who, who Greeks called Hathor, 
are symbolically impregnating Osset the virgin by holding onx, which is the eternal symbol of life, the African symbol of life, holding uh, uh, onx, A-N-K-H-S, to the nostrils of the virgin mother to be Osset. This is the immaculate conception that if you and when if you grew up Catholic like I did, or if you go to go to Sunday school and the Protestant church, things like this, you learn about the Immaculate Conception. Okay. But did they tell you the Immaculate Conception was African? Then you have the adoration that we see at the top here, the fourth panel. The fourth depiction, the adoration, the newborn Heru is portrayed receiving gifts from three kings or three magi while being adored by a host of gods and men. The adoration. So and they the 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 three kings comes from the three stars in Orion's belt, Orion the hunter, the constellation of Orion in ancient times was that of Asar and the three stars in Orion's belt are pointing also to so uh, 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 Orion the hunter is followed by uh, two constellations and is referred to as two dogs the big dog Canis Major and the small dog Canis, Mi uh, uh, Canis Minor in the constellation of the big dog Canis Major you have the star Sirius, which is the brightest star in, in the sky, the star Sirius. And we know that the star, uh, the three stars in Orion's belt, okay, at a certain time of the year, three stars in Orion's belt point to the star Sirius. They fall in line to the star Sirius as well. In the story of the, 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 the three wise men, um, going to leaving going from the orient asia to uh bethlehem to uh adore the baby jesus or yeshua in the story they say that they followed a star in the east okay uh but when you look at a map bethlehem is to the west of asia okay when you look at a map we look at it ge uh, geographically bethlehem is to the west of asia so why did they see a star in the east and go west i mean this is it's a story this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness it's a story okay it's a story uh but anyway let's continue all right, so we look at things like evidence that prove African people sailed to the Americas long before Christopher Columbus. We, we deal with uh, the African presence going back at least 51,700 years ago, but we, we can look at information from Christopher Columbus himself. According to a renowned American historian and linguist, uh, Leo Weiner, of Harvard University, one of the strongest pieces of evidence to support the fact that African people or black people sailed to America before Christopher Columbus. Now, Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. He comes to the Americas. The closest he came to this land was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. So in the class, we show you where he goes on his four voyages. This is why it's important to look at this, understand his history chronologically. We know he had a Moors navigating some of his ships. Uh, we know that he's using nautical instruments based upon uh, the technology that the Moors introduced into Europe. One of those nautical instruments is called an uh, astrolay um, as well. So everything that we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. OK, and, I, 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 and this is why I say I wish we had never taught them. OK, everything we taught them came back to kick us in the behind. So. Uh, before Christopher Columbus was uh, one, one of the strongest pieces of evidence to support the fact that black people sailed to America before Christopher Columbus was a journal entry from Columbus himself. In Leo Weiner's book, Africa and the Discovery of America, 
he explains that Columbus noted in his journal that the Native Americans confirmed uh, black skinned people had come from the southeast in boats trading in gold tip spears. This is what Columbus wrote in his own journals because he kept a journal. So did um, Bartolomeu de las Casas, right? Reverend Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, who uh, sailed on uh, some of uh, Columbus's voyages with him as well. And he ends up writing two books about this, uh, Tears of the Indians. And I, re I read his books, uh, Bartolome de las Casas' books back in college. So the discovery, uh, then you have the discovery of narcotics in, the, uh, in Egyptian mummies um, uh, as well, has left uh, some historians amazed. Uh, so th there's different archaeological discoveries that we look at, different evidence of the African presence here in the Americas. Also, when we look at Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, we know page 13 of his book, page 14 of his book, I should say, deals with the discovery made by Dr. Albert Goodyear in Allendale County, South Carolina. in 2004 okay and this discovery they found uh, 13 different types of evidence 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an african presence uh in the land that we call the united states of america okay this is in uh the territory we call south carolina they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carving, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. Um, they found uh, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,000 to 100 years ago. And these are the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. They're the ancestors that I knew in the Twa, and they and they were they were here in this land as well. These uh, these are the short statured Africans. Okay. So this is Dr. Albert Goodyear here, and we reference uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence in in the in the class also dr david m hotep is a friend of mine is is uh this is his first book first americans were africans documented evidence his new book is out i have to get his new book it came out a few months ago came out um i think it came out late 2021 because i interviewed him october 12 2021 on columbus day and we were dealing with a lot of this history his new book is The First Americans Were Africans Revised and Expanded. The First Americans Were Africans Revised and, and Expanded uh, is his first book, okay? And he's not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not take place. What he's saying is, is that African people were here in this land we call the United States of America thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade took place. This was our land stolen from us. OK, we were here in this land before Native Americans came into existence. This is not an attack on Native Americans. I have Cherokee and Blackfoot on my mother's side of the family. This is not an attack on them. This is just understanding the history. We already know that African people were the first people on the face of this earth. We already know that African people circumnavigated the globe. So you think that you, you realistically think that we first came here in this land, conquered and shackled in chains in 1619, conquered by Europeans. And we taught them how to sail and we gave them the technology that their nautical instruments are based upon. And you think that's when we first came to this land? I mean, that, that's, that's not even logical. OK, so this is Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's a uh, archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. He's, he's a white man. This is an article from ScienceDaily.com that deals with um, his discovery. There are other articles about it that you can read as well. Uh, the name of this article is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 
50,000 years ago. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. This article is from November 18th, 2004. Here's a summary of the article from ScienceDaily.com. Um, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains. Uh, I said radiocarbon tests of uh, carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. You can read the entire article. This is just a summary of it. Okay. And they're talking about the Khoisan. So the Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet, as I stated. An October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa, including South Africa, are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans uh, with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. So here's a picture of two uh, Khoisan women. Now, the Khoisan live mainly in southern Africa in territories spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers or gatherers, the Sans people, okay, S-A-N-S, and, and, uh, and keepers of livestock, the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan uh, languages include the, distinct, the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors, the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. Now, the movie Black Panther, and we deal with the movie Black Panther here uh, in the class also, because the movie Black Panther uh, con uh, connects us to African history and culture and language and spiritual systems, things like this. The movie Black Panther is very deep. The language spoken in the film Black Panther is Isikosa, okay? And Isikosa is a Bantu language. Um, and Isikosa has the click sounds in it also, okay? And Bantu is a group of uh, 500 um, African languages. And there's a slide I want to go to here. Uh, dealing with Bantu, but Isikosa is a Bantu language. Um, Kiswahili is a, a Bantu language as well. And let me find this here. Okay. So what is Bantu? Bantu is a group of uh, some 500 languages belonging to the Bantoid subgroup of the Banu Congo branch of the Niger Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a very large area, including most of Africa, from southern Cameroon eastward to um, for southern Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent. Twelve Bantu languages are spoken by more than five million people including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, Isikosa, or Kosa, which is the um, language spoken in the film Black Panther, and Zulu or Amazulu, okay? Now, Swahili or Kiswahili, which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language, is a Bantu lingua franca important in both commerce and literature. So this is uh, Britannica.com has some information on Bantu languages. Uh, there's other information you can look at, but this gives a good uh, brief synopsis here. So the, 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 um, the word Wakanda is a real word as well. Um, 
Wakanda is not just in the comic books. Uh, Wakanda is, uh, we see it in Omaha, Ponca, and Sioux Indian languages. It means possesses secret powers. We know that, and it's also um, um, a Bantu word as well. It's Key Congo also. Um, the panther deity that we see in the film Black Panther, Bast, comes from Bastet, which comes straight out of ancient Kemet. Bastet is a netter or a deity or what Europeans call gods. Um, that Bastet was an ancient Kemetic uh, Neteru or goddess, Neter or goddess, worshipped in the form of a lioness and later a cat. She was goddess of warfare in Lower Kemet, worshipped as early as the Second Dynasty around 2890 BCE before the Common Era. So there are 11 different African cultures that we see infused in the film Black Panther as well. See represented in the film Black Panther. And then when you get, so I, I did, um, I have lectures that I've done dealing with the film Black Panther, as you can probably tell. Um, I did about three months of research on the film and the comic book to really understand um, what I was seeing in the film to get a better understanding. There are two books that I read as well. Uh, I read this book here, Black Panther from Marvel, The Ultimate Guide. So this deals with the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book because we see characters and themes and things like this represented in the film. Okay, so I had to get a better understanding of that to be able to uh, do the present to do my lectures on the film. And this is uh, full color. It's a really, really good book. Gives a lot of background information. Uh, gives information about the Dormalaji and the origins of the Dormalaji, things like this. Uh, information on Killmonger, etc. Okay. So I read this one. And then also I read um, there was um, th this other book here that deals with the film and it has interviews with the cast members and director, etc. cetera. Uh, Marvel Black Panther, the official movie tie-in. Marvel Black Panther, the official movie tie-in, okay? So there are 11 different African cultures that we see represented uh, in the film Black Panther. And we know Chadwick Boseman passed away recently as well. Okay, so that was a tragic loss when he passed away. But I had to get a better understanding of the movie and the comic book to be able to, to do uh, uh, my lectures on the subject matter. So when we look at the uh, Wakandan religion, religions, and uh, well, Wakanda is um, made up of 18 different tribes also. Wakanda is not just one clan or one group of people. They're made up of 18 different tribes. The, Panth the uh, Pan Panther clan is the clan that T'Challa belonged to. But you had the Jabari tribe, you have the Crocodile tribe, things like this. But the religion of, and let me go to this slide here, okay. The religion of the Wakandan people first developed during the pilgrimage to the land in their conflict with the originators. The gods of Wakanda formed uh, from the heroes of, of humans within the tribe. Ascending to the status of a deity or a god, these heroes became the Orisha. Now, the this is this is from the Black Panther comic book. The Orisha or Orishas or Orishas, these these are the deities in the spiritual system of Ifa practiced amongst the Yoruba in Nigeria. 
the Orishas. And if you deal with um, Santeria or if you deal with some of the uh, uh, syncretic um, religions and things like, like this that are a combination of African spirituality and Catholicism or Christianity, what have you, you'll see the Orishas referred to Shango, Yemenya, uh, Obatala, Ogun, things like this. The uh, These heroes became the Orishas, taking the names Koku, Thoth, and Thoth is what the um, the Greeks called a uh, Dehuti, Thoth, uh, Bast or Bastet, coming out of ancient Kemet, Mujaji, and Patak. Okay, there's a picture of Pata right behind me. All right, the craftsman Pata and Niyami. This uh, so a lot of this just comes out of ancient Egypt, ancient Africa. The Orishas origins date back to the ancient Egyptian beings known as the Ennead. Okay. This is straight from the comic book. Okay, the Orishas origins date back to the ancient Egyptian beings known as the Ennead. Well, what's the Ennead? Ennead in Greek means group of nine, and the Ennead uh, refers to uh, like the nine original Neteru, so to speak. In addition to the development of these deity, the people of Wakanda became segmented into various cults that worshiped various, according to the comic book, animal gods of the area. Now, African people didn't worship animals as gods. What they worship, what what they saw was that we're all part of nature. African people are part of nature. The animals are part of nature, and that th all of that comes from the Creator. Nature comes from the Creator. So they saw the uh, they respected the gifts that the creator gave each one of the animals whether it's the the keen eyesight that a falcon has whether it's the keen sense of discernment and taste and judgment that a, a canine has what have you they didn't african people didn't worship animals as gods they honor and respected the gift that the creator gave the animal each animal has unique gifts Okay, whether it's the scarab beetle that rolls up its eggs in the dung of cows, okay, and they're called dung beetles also. So it's a different, it's coming from African cosmology. Cosmology deals with understanding the universe as an orderly system, but also the role that you play in that orderly system. So coming from the European interpretation, they say, oh, African people, they worship the sun. No, they, we saw the sun as a symbol of the creator because the sun gives life to every living thing. And wherever you go in the world, you'll see the sun. They African people didn't worship a tree. OK, they didn't worship a dog. They didn't worship an animal. They didn't worship a cow, so to speak. They worship the gift. They understood the gift that the creator gave the cow gave the falcon and saw that we're all part of nature okay we're all connected so in addition to the development of these gods the people of wakanda became segmented into various cults that worshiped various animal gods of or deities of the area the most famous cults included the black panther cult and the white gorilla cult. This is straight from the Black Panther comic book. 18 tribes in total developed in the country of Wakanda and included the lion cult, crocodile cult, and hyena. So we go through and, and look at the African influence on the film Black Panther, the 11 different African cultures coming from Ethiopia, Nigeria, and different things like this, ancient Kemet, etc. This is the, the movie Black Panther is a deep movie on multiple levels. So I, I mentioned the Ennead just a minute ago. What, what are the Ennead? The Ennead means group of nine in Greek, in the Greek language. In Kemet, ancient Kemet, they were called Pesjet. The nine Neteru 
were Atom, the sun, um, uh, Shu, the uh, air, um, Tefnut, moisture, Geb, earth, Nut, sky, which is refers to as the sky, Asar, who the Greeks called Osiris, Oset, who the Greeks called Isis, Set, who is the brother of Asar, and, and Nephetus. Okay. If you look at page um, 274 to 277 of ancient Egypt, and this is another book that we use in the class as reference. You don't have to buy any of these books, but this is another book we use as reference in the class. They break this down, this book here. It's a huge book. Oh, no, that's my Civil War. This is, that's for my other class that I teach. This is my Civil War book. Um, this book here. Okay, this is a huge book, Ancient Egypt by Lorna Oaks and Lucia G Gollin. Okay, and this goes through, and, and I mean, they have so much in this book. This goes through and breaks all this stuff down. So we use this as reference. Um, this book was about 10 bucks when I got it. I get they got this at... Uh, Barnes and Nobles or Borders Books or something like this. This is the tomb of Nefertari. Okay. So this is a, a really good reference book here. Uh, I got this in 2009, June 12, 2009. All right. And then they have one of the things that we look at in the class, they break down the Netaru. They have a chart here for the Netaru, which comes in handy. Under uh, page 274, it starts. The deities. And they list the Netaru, and they list the different at their different aspects as well. Okay. Two of the other books that we use in the class you don't have to buy any of these once again. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. There's a good essay in here by Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay and a good one from Renoko Rashidi as well. Then also this book from Renoko Rashidi, we know he passed away August uh, 2nd, uh, 2021. Renoko was a friend of mine. I interviewed him a number of times on the African History Network show. Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe, okay, which deals with some of the history of the Moors in Europe as well. And we look at the, uh, we look at page 95 here, page 90. We see the black Madonna and child in different uh, European uh, countries. This one right here, this is in Switzerland, uh, black Madonna in, in Swiss, Switzerland. We see it here in, in Saskatchewan, Poland. This painting right here. Uh, we look at this one, the Black Virgin of Madrid, Spain. Look at that one. We look at this one, the Black Virgin and Child statue in St. John's Church, Luxembourg City, Lux Luxembourg. Okay, this is page 90 and 91. We look at this one. This, these are the Moors' he heads on the um, uh, national flag of Sardinia. Okay, the national flag of Sardinia, which is uh, an Italian island, and we deal we break we deal with all that in the class that ties into the history of the Moors also, because the Moors were in Sardinia, they were in Sicily, they go all throughout Europe. All right, so how you all like this type of information? So this is just a. Um, a brief overview. This is a 10 week online history class that I teach. I teach this on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time normally. Um, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And we look at different uh, briefly, we look at different African civilizations also, and we deal with some of the history of the Moors um, as well. This is uh, St. Maurice, who becomes a patron saint to Germany. 
this is the national flags of Corsica and Sardinia. Uh, and they have the African Moors heads on them. Uh, also, we know the Moors uh, lose control January 2nd, 1492, the last stronghold, uh, Granada. Uh, we look at, you know, Ghana, Songhai, and Mali, also the three great West African uh, empires. We have to look at Columbus because um, Columbus is crucial to understanding the transatlantic slave trade. Columbus was convinced that he would find a new and lucrative sea route to the Orient by sailing west to find silk, tea, spices, gold, etc. This was big business in the 15th century. Uh, Columbus intended uh, to chart a Western sea route to China and the fabled gold and, and, and spice islands of Asia. Instead, he landed in the Bahamas, becoming the first European to uh, explore uh, the Americas, it becoming the first European to explore uh, the Americas since the Vikings set up colonies in Greenland and Newfoundland during the 10th century. 10th century AD. Now, Europeans lost their trading route to Asia because of the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and you, so you, Europe lost this popular trading route. The Ottoman Turks captured Constantinople and thus diverted the trade in Eastern European slaves away from the Mediterranean to Islamic markets. The Italians increasingly took uh, the Italians increasingly looked to North Africa as their source for slaves. OK, um, now Columbus never found that that sea route to the West. Also, OK, he was determined to find a direct water route west from Europe to Asia, but he never did. Now, what he did find. Um, these island nations are still dealing with the repercussions of what happened over 500 years ago and being conquered by the, by the Spanish. Um, Columbus goes into uh, the Bahamas. That's on his first voyage, which he set sail August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina Penta and the Santa Maria. He goes into the Bahamas. Uh, which he calls San Salvador. He goes into Cuba, Hispaniola. We know the western third of the island of Hispaniola is where Haiti is today. The Spanish call it Santa Domingo. The French call it Saint Dominique. The French take over that western third of the island of Hispaniola in 1697 from the Spanish. Uh, his second voyage, September 1493, uh, he goes into the West Indies and Puerto Rico, uh, also Jamaica in 1494. Third voyage, May 1498, goes in Trinidad and Venezuela mainland. Uh, fourth voyage, May 1504, goes into Panama and Honduras in Central America. He never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. If you go to history.com and search for um, Christopher Columbus, they have some good information there. But he never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. OK, give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. And we go through and look at this history chronologically. Uh, we look at what was the transatlantic slave trade, what leads up to it. We know in 1488, Pope Innocent VIII accepted a gift of 100 Moorish slaves from King Ferdinand of Spain and then distributed these more slaves to various cardinals and nobles. Um, we go through and look at geography uh, also. And uh, so these are, this is just a brief overview uh, of the class, okay? This is a 10 week online class that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So if you like any of this information, you can register for this course. Uh, we have the information at our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. If you go to the old website, africanhistorynetwork.com, it's going to redirect you to the new one. Our new website is theafricanhistorynetwork.com. I teach this class on Saturdays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This class, Saturday, July 2nd, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The class is regularly $130. It's on sale $60. Uh, Sundays, uh, I teach... 
from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So then this class is Sunday, July 3rd. You can join us in class. Uh, as soon as you register, you can watch the archive content. You can watch the class we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, I got my laptop back from the repair shop because the charging system died on this. I just got it back this week. So we'll have class uh, this weekend and we'll have uh, I'll do my uh, radio show, the African History Network show. The radio station will be shut down for the 4th of July weekend, but we're going to broadcast on our social media platforms and on my blog talk radio network also. So we'll be on Sunday live 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The African History Network on Facebook and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. Uh, you can support us also uh, through Cash App and PayPal. Uh, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show and uh, through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. This is our official Cash App account, dollar sign the AHN show, S H O W. When you go to it, it'll say Michael and show my picture there. These other ones uh, are, are fake African History Network Cash App accounts that I'm still trying to get shut down. Uh, I've launched a uh, Cash App has launched an investigation, so I'm still trying to get them uh, shut down. OK, but you can uh, register for the class. It's on sale, $60, regularly $130. We have a bundle pack. Also, we you uh, get both classes for only $100. It's actually about a $385 value because you get some bonus lectures for me also in digital uh, format as well. So we have the bundle pack here at our new website also. And if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, since I've been teaching them since 2017, uh, email me at AHN show at African history network.com. You get a 50% discount. Email me at AHN show at African history network.com. You get a 50% discount on the classes. Okay. All right. So hopefully you like this type of information. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on the broadcast. You can register for the class. Now, as soon as you register, uh, you can start watching the content. You can join us in class. Uh, also live. Once again, we uh, you don't have to be live in the class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch them anytime. OK, you, so a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire 10 week course and you can watch from around the world uh, as well. OK, so we have the information here. Thanks for joining us today. Follow us on our social media platforms, the African History Network on Facebook. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. Uh, also Instagram, uh, Michael M. Hotep on Instagram as well. And The AHN Show on Twitter. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk.